As a type 1 diabetic, you'll be dead in 10 years. And before you die, you'll experience a list of complications, loss of limbs, and a disintegrating will to live. Starting today, you can't have any carbs, especially sugar, and no doctor knows enough to help you change that outcome. Those were the words delivered to me on my diagnosis day as a type 1 diabetic. And it's time we debunk those and a series of other diabetic myths that could wreck your blood sugars or even end your life. One of these myths could put you in the ER with a normal blood sugar, and most people, not even doctors, have ever heard of it. Another is so baked into our culture that athletes with type 1 are told they'll never compete until they do. And the last one, it's the reason thousands of people are walking around with the wrong diagnosis and the wrong treatment. Let's start with one that I've seen ruin people's health in ways they never saw coming. Myth number one, exercise burns glucose, so I don't need insulin when I work out. I get it, it sounds logical, right? Muscles can use glucose without insulin during exercise, that's a fact. But here's what most people, including many healthcare providers, don't tell you. Insulin's job goes way beyond just lowering blood sugar. Now, I like to do science deep dives, so let's do it. During exercise, skeletal muscles increase glucose uptake through insulin-independent pathways, mainly by GLUT4 transporter activation triggered by muscle contraction. Now, what does that even mean, right? Your muscles are like sponges for glucose. When you work out, it's like squeezing the sponge. You use the glucose that's been stored in your muscles for contraction, right? When you do that, your muscles want to soak back up glucose from your bloodstream after a workout or even during sometimes. And that is one of the reasons why you see lowered blood sugars during or after workouts. And you might see a reduced need for insulin overall. So muscles can independently lower blood sugars just like insulin, except it's a little bit different pathway. So muscles soak it up into the muscle. Insulin is the key that transports glucose from the bloodstream into the muscles or the liver or adipose tissue. But insulin is still critical for suppressing ketone production. Probably familiar with ketones as a diabetic, right? Want to avoid those. Without it, even with normal glucose, ketones can actually build up into something called euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. In other words, euglycemic DKA. You likely have heard of that topic before as well. Too high of ketones and you put yourself at risk of some pretty severe circumstances where you're going to end up in the hospital or worse. Now, insulin also assists in regulating potassium levels. Without insulin, potassium shifts out of cells, risking dangerous arrhythmias. Now, insulin is also important for fat metabolism. See, without insulin, you burn fat in an uncontrolled way. This is where ketone overload comes into play. In fact, years ago, I had a client that thought they could go light on insulin before a long training ride, before working with us. Right? Blood sugar looked perfect the whole time. They just shut off their insulin pump and went for the ride. But a couple of hours later, they were dizzy, nauseous, and their chest felt tight. They checked, blood sugar was 105. It was perfect. But they were vomiting and ran to the hospital, thankfully. Ketones were through the roof. It wasn't until months later when working with us that they learned about euglycemic DKA the hard way, right? They looked back and realized that's what was happening. See, euglycemic means normal blood sugars, right? Glycemic, blood sugars, you, normal. Euglycemic, normal blood sugars and DKA. And here's the thing, most ER doctors don't even test for ketones when your glucose looks fine. That's how people slip through until it's critical. And I'll link a free training in the description where I do show you how to manage exercise without risking this. Now, myth number two, you'll eventually go blind or lose limbs no matter what you do. It's what I was told when I was diagnosed actually by my doctor, terrible. This one is brutal because it's built on outdated truth. Decades ago, before modern insulin analogs, before CGMs, before what we know about blood sugar variability, yes, complications were almost inevitable, right? Which is where we get the standard of get your A1C below a seven came from because 
that was the threshold that had been studied and uh, it produced the strongest correlation of reducing the risk of diabetic complications if you could get your a1c below a seven so they focused solely on the a1c right now for a science deep dive major studies like from the dcct and uh, edic they showed that every one percent drop in a1c reduces risk of microvascular complications by 37 percent now after you get it below a seven that improvement that benefit if it does seem to drop off a bit, getting it below a six or below a five doesn't show as strong of an improvement, but below a seven was a huge threshold that they marked. Now, stable glucose reduces oxidative stress and inflammation that drive complications. So a lot of new studies show that it's actually the stable blood sugars that are gonna help you out the most, as long as you're within a relatively normal range, right? So it's almost better to be at 160 milligrams per deciliter if you're always at 160 versus have an average of 90, but you hit 50 and 300 every single day, right? And with today's tools, you can maintain non-diabetic A1Cs and a time and range over 90%, making complication risk extremely low. This is what I aim for personally, is as close as I can get to perfection without holding myself to a perfection standard because that would obviously have a pretty heavy toll on my peace of mind because you can't be perfect in anything. Now, one of our private clients came to us terrified. She'd been told she wasn't doing enough despite an A1C in the low sixes. Within months, she was hitting non-diabetic numbers and eating dessert on vacation without swings. Her eye doctor literally told her, said, if I didn't know your history, I'd never guess you have diabetes. What changed? And she said, she came back to us and told us that she said, I started working with Matt to get my blood sugar formula set up and reduce the wacky swings that sent me on the blood sugar roller coaster. So more stable numbers equals less stress on my eyes, right? And her eye doctor was like, ah, yep, you got it. You figured it out. That's, <laughs> that's the key and I'm really happy for you, right? Now, in fact, if you wanna see exactly how we do that without burnout, because that's the key, right? You gotta have a sustainable plan. I put a free training in the description for you. Now, myth number three, you can't be an athlete or do extreme sports with type one. <sighs> this one fires me up because I've done Ironman races now. Right, in fact, kind of to prove that point, I kind of like proving my doctors wrong. Uh, I weight lift, you know, I've trained alongside some of the fittest people in the world with type one, right? Now, as a science-y side of this, regular training increases insulin sensitivity through enhanced GLUT4 expression. We talked about that earlier, the independent uptake of glucose into your muscles from the bloodstream. It's also going to improve your mitochondrial function in muscles and it's gonna reduce your baseline inflammation. Inflammation plays a huge role in our health. This leads to flatter blood sugars and easier corrections. Now, I'm gonna give you kind of a personal story because it's just fun talking about this stuff. The hardest part isn't the sport, it's the planning, right? So I can do a 100 mile bike ride without a single scary low and staying in the 90s to 120s for milligrams per deciliter, right? Blood sugars, basically non-diabetic range but only because I know how to adjust insulin, fuel timing and hydration. Keep in mind, this is also with me having hundreds of carbs. And here's the kicker too. My blood sugars are actually easier to manage when I'm training consistently versus when I'm not. And I'll share maybe in a future video exactly how I fuel for an Ironman without wrecking my numbers. I know that's a, a pretty interesting topic for many. Now, myth number four, pumps and CGMs do all the work for you. See, I love technology, but pumps and CGMs are tools, not brains. I, I talk about this in other videos, but it's kind of like you're the CEO and your pump and CGM, maybe the smart algorithms that are behind the scenes are your front desk or your secretary. Fantastic assistant, but they can't replace you as the CEO, right? You have to be the one that makes the decisions. So again, science behind this, the automated insulin delivery systems or AID use algorithms that are based on your current blood glucose, your rate of change. In other words, is it going up, down, all around? Your insulin on board, right? Those are the three things. Some of them track patterns, but patterns are honestly worse in my opinion because day to day looks different for most of us. And they can't predict when you're about to sprint to your car, right? Or you're about to eat a double-double and a milkshake from In-N-Out, if you're in San Diego like me. <laughs> or, you know, they don't know if you're stressed out about a meeting, 
right? And I had a smart pump over deliver insulin before a workout because it thought that I was trending too high, right? It was actually intentional. I wanted to be a little higher. I was at 160 because I was about to work out, right? I ended up crashing mid set because of the correction that it gave me. What it was trying to help me with, it lacked context of. See these algorithms, they act independently almost as if they're inside of a black box because all they see are blood sugars, the trend, and your insulin on board. They don't know what you're about to do. They don't know what other variables are at play. They don't know that you walked by the M&M bowl at the, the front desk and you grabbed a couple, right? <laughs> so it's very difficult for it to manage everything. You have to be the pilot. It's okay to have this you know, assistant navigating with you, but you gotta be the pilot. You gotta be the one in control. In fact, we had a client that came to me frustrated, similar situation, CGM plus pump on full auto, still spiking daily. Once we took manual control with formulas, she flattened her line within a week. Blood sugars, stable, predictable, everything made sense. And those formulas that I talk about often, they're in the free training in the description. <clears throat> now myth number five, type one diabetes and type two diabetes are basically the same. <laughs> this one isn't just wrong, it's dangerous, right? Now, science side of this, type one is an autoimmune destruction of beta cells, absolute insulin deficiency. We have to act as our own pancreas. We manually give insulin through a pump or through a shot, or I guess technically inhaled as well, if you're familiar with a Freza. Uh, now type two diabetes, insulin resistance. Often there's an initial high insulin level. So if they're very insulin resistant, their body has to produce more insulin to do the same work of digesting the food that's been consumed. And over time, the pancreas gets tired, right? And that insulin resistance doesn't go anywhere. So it's a different beast entirely. Now another version of this, there's like nine versions of diabetes now, but LADA or L-A-D-A -A is latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. Often this is the one that's misdiagnosed as type two, leading to months or years of ineffective treatment. I know far too many people, clients of mine, friends of mine who found out that they were LADA after being diagnosed with type two for the previous decade and wondering why their labs always came back messed up, right? In fact, up to 40% of of adults diagnosed with type two who are lean and active may actually have LADA, 40%. See, I've met so many people who went months without insulin because they were told they were just type two, right? By the time they got proper treatment, their health had tanked. The truth, overall, you've heard these myths, but you can thrive with type one diabetes, but you do need the right information, not recycled myths from decades ago. That's why I created a free training where I walk you through the exact blood sugar formulas my clients use to hit non-diabetic numbers while still living their best lives. The link is in the description. It's time to demystify diabetes so that you can finally thrive with type one, not just survive. Go watch it now and let's rewrite your story. Happy to have you here. Enjoy that training and keep up the fight.